It's time for the BallQuest Mailbag Podcast, answering your questions from the General's Quarters every week, right here on BallQuest. Good Thursday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com Mailbag Podcast, presented by our good friends at Smoky Mountain Organics, East Tennessee's most trusted health and wellness store. Remember, SmokyMountainOrganics.com are there four locations in East Tennessee to serve you, including that location in Knoxville at 8018 Kingston Pike, right across from Trader Joe's. We thank them for their sponsorship and continued partnership uh, with the VolQuest.com podcast. Don't forget, too, I don't, I don't do this nearly enough, but don't forget, if you're viewing this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. Same for SoundCloud, Spotify. Give us a like, give us a subscribe out there to those channels. We would greatly appreciate it. With Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I am Brent Hubbs, and we've got plenty of questions in this mailbag edition of the podcast to get to. And uh, we'll go reverse order today. We'll start at the bottom and work our way towards the top. So uh, we're going to go out of the gate with Farmer Vol, who wants to know, um, let's assume the Vols hold on to everyone they have committed. I know that's a long shot, but for this question, let's assume that. Can you name five to seven guys you think the Vols have a legit shot at landing that if they landed them, all of you would say this is a class that will bring Tennessee back to competing for championships? I know it's a broad class question, but just wonder what guys need to be added for you guys to be really impressed with this class. Let's take the last sentence of that question, AP. What guys need to be added to this class for you to be really impressed? Who, who do you like out there that Tennessee's in on that, that you think would be great fits for Tennessee? Well, one, you have to add Carnell Tate. You know, I mean, that that's that's the, the one you have the best shot with. He's, you know, arguably the one of the you know, top couple of receivers in the country. Um, you know, so I'll go Carnell Tate. I think Bryson Sanders, because that's another in-state guy with a with a big ranking that would help your class. Um, Christian Conyers, um, you know, those are the first three. I'll go Jakeem Jackson because you need speed at corner. And right now, Tennessee is in a pretty good spot for him. And then five, you know, one of these defensive linemen, you know, uh, you know, I mean, in fact, you know, you'd love to add a lot of those defensive linemen, but whether it's TJ Searcy or Tyree Weathersby, or maybe they take a big swing at Derek LeBlanc and, and somehow find a way to land a kid from Florida, you know, they, they've got to land one or two of these defensive linemen along the way. Austin, after visiting with Isaiah Shirley, where would you put him in terms of, kind of how he fits Tennessee, the need that they have there. What, what do you what do you like about him? B- bigger picture, not necessarily that he's one of the five to seven, but you talk about defensive linemen. What, what do you think about him after visiting with him? Well, he's a good-looking kid. Um, you know, uh, the, they really are recruiting, like, the same type bodies. Um, there's a lot of guys that are like, and they talked about this on the board, like 250 to 265 pounds that can easily put on – you know, 25 pounds and 30 pounds and, you know, play interior on the defensive line and probably not miss a beat. But, you know, you look at, you know, Weathersby, uh, Searcy, um, you know, even a guy like LeBlanc or, or you know, Isaiah Shirley, they're all similar body styles. Um, you know, I've not talked to, to Shirley. I need to give him a call just because, you know, he talked about like letting the kind of visit settle and not, you know, kind of feeling out where you're, how you feel, you know, after the visit high wears off, you know, I'd be interested to see kind of where he thinks Tennessee stands. Tennessee was late to the party, but that doesn't mean that they can't crash the party and, and, and land Isaiah Shirley. Rob, in terms of those body types, I mean, is it just a sense, you think it's a case where that makes more sense than to go try to get a big body guy that you may have to cut some weight off of. And and after seeing uh, Tim Banks and Rodney Garner's defensive line approach this past year in terms of trying to play in the backfield tackle for losses and all those things, do you think that they may be a little bit smaller in nature than, than you know, maybe some of these other defensive lines that are playing with a big heavy nose or, yeah. or something like you know, that? It's ironic because I was having this conversation with, with a super fan the other day who was asking me about – defensive line recruiting and he was like you know where's the six four 300 pound guy and I'll, I'll tell you I, I would be worried about it too until I think about who's coaching him and whatever Rodney Garner thinks about what he wants in a defensive lineman I'm I'm fine with you're good you're checking that box but, I, I, okay. but I, you have to wonder I mean he's not always been that way I mean, you look at the Derek Browns of the world I mean I was, so I wonder if philosophically you know he's changed or I wonder if, or if the way offenses play these days if it's made him kind of rethink what he thinks is a, is a prototypical defensive lineman or what, you know, what kind of 
body type does fit best. But and, and also those dudes are hard to find too. I mean, I, I think that's probably part of it. You watch two two JUCO guys too, Elijah Davis, East Mississippi, and then out in Kansas you've got Will Whitson, originally from like the Cincinnati area. Right now the only offers are Buffalo and Tennessee, but he's a freak athlete. He's just got really, really, really bad grades, and is going to have to you know, really kind of bear down if he's going to make it out of Juco. Um, but from an athletic standpoint, from a football standpoint, kid, kid's really, really talented. So he'll be here. Uh, both those kids will be here for Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, a couple of little nuggets dropped there with a couple of Juco names out there. I, I think it will – I think it's easier to find a guy to put 15 pounds on him or, or 20 pounds on him than it is to guy, find a guy and have him drop 25 pounds. And, um, and while we're talking about, is there ever been a better example of a guy doing that and it working than Matthew Butler since we've, since we've been doing this? I mean, it's been, a, I mean, you know, you'd have to go way back, you know, probably pre-internet days, early, early to mid nineties to look at a guy like that. But yeah, I mean, you just, again, I think it's easier for those guys to develop strength the right way and keep their athletic ability at the college level than it is to try to take a guy and drop a bunch of weight off of him, hoping that he becomes explosive. Austin, you mentioned this in the, I think in the podcast of the week, I mean, Elijah Simmons, they dropped weight off of him and, and there wasn't a big noticeable difference in the, in the explosion. So what are they going right. to do him this, you know, this fall? Is he going to put weight back on? So is it easier to get a, an explosive guy and try to put weight on him as opposed to going the other direction. I don't know. Maybe that's a theme there. Maybe that's just the fact that in the footprint that Tennessee's recruiting, there's more guys with that body type than there is the big body type. Cause Rob, as you mentioned, they're a little bit hard, that they're not exactly easy to find uh, that they're the most coveted guys out there is that six, four, 300 pound athletic freak. Um, let's go on to vol for life. Three, seven, six, four, three. Um, do you think recruits prefer covet NIL deals or relationships with coaches as their number one priority when choosing a school? Could NIL be the end of college athletics? It seems out of control right now. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, like, again, I think most kids still want the relationship. And I think that the NIL stuff, um, you know, is something that, how do I phrase this? It, it's a nice cherry on top. Now there are some that are just all about the money mm -hmm. period. And, and they don't care about relationships. They don't care about, they don't care about the school. They just want the payday. But I think for the most part, it still boils down to old school recruiting. And then what puts the cherry on top and gets you over the hump are potential NIL deals. Yeah, I don't think the relationship stuff is going to go away. But I think the fact of the matter is, I mean, most, I mean, the way things are operating right now, you're going to be able to have both. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to me, it's like if you're, if you've just got your, you know, master's degree or your, or your undergrad degree and you come out, Rob, and, and, you're in the, and you're in the marketplace and you've got two jobs to pick from and they're in the same ballpark from a salary standpoint, a financial standpoint, then, then it gets back to me. You're, you're not making that over a few thousand. You're making not, not making that decision over a few thousand dollars. It's based on location. It's based on people, work environment, all those things. I, I think NIL is going to be a little bit of that as we move forward, because I think, and maybe I'm wrong. I do think the marketplace settles down to, to some degree where, where you're kind of pigeonholing guys based on positions. And there's going to be kind of a, quantitative number out there instead of just, you know, kind of throwing a, a dart at the wall, so to speak. Maybe I'm wrong, but, but, but I do think that you're going to get back to where guys are going to have, you know, the cherry on top, Austin, as you describe it, are, are all going to be very similar in, in numbers. It's all going to look very similar th than it is. One's going to be way out of kilter compared to the other number. Well, well, I think what you're saying right now is a lot of kids or, or or whatever the camps for the kids are all you know throwing out numbers and using schools well so and so is going to give me blank you know and then the school they're talking to has to calculate is that real or is that not real you know i think you know, there is a lot of that going on 
you have to you have to kind of you know and and so you may lose out on a kid because the kid was telling you the truth and you kind of called his bluff or you may get a kid because you called his bluff you know I, it works both ways and so it really to me depends on like are you comfortable calling the bluff and letting that kid walk to school x or do you really want this kid you may end up you may end up overpaying him but and at the end of the day, it's not the coach. The money's not going out of the coach's pocket, which I think makes that decision easier you know, to sign off on. But to the other part of the question, I don't think college athletics is dying. I mean, do you guys? Do I, think I it's mean, it's going to be different. No, I think it's going to be different. I, I think there's too much money involved for it to be dying. Um, That's what I think. T- now, TV ratings at now, the end of the day. I- I'll say this. I mean, there are people around the country that are going – 50% of TV revenue, California, that's what your bill is going to be out there. No way, no way that's a sustainable number out there that you're going to take the 50% of your TV revenue to your school and it's going to go to student athletes. That's, that's an unrealistic number. That's the, um, but, but the, the fact of the matter is, what, the, what is that, what is that number for Tennessee right now? Oh gosh. I don't, I don't even know what that, I, I don't know what that SEC number is. I know it's getting ready to go up dramatically with this new TV deal right now. Um, I mean, that'd be a lot of money to give to a lot of student athletes, and yeah, I mean, and, and money that money that athletic departments are spending and have spent. And I mean, have Nick a, wants it. Well, Nick wants it all to be fair. Want everybody <laughs> to get the same. Yeah, but you know, clearly, clearly, Nick Saban and you know. Other coaches around college football get paid the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, well what is, I mean, the ahead. SEC distributed seven hundred and seventy-five million when they when they split up the pie. You know, this this off this past fiscal year. What is that? AP's great at math? What is that divided by fourteen? I mean, that's about fifty that's million. A bunch of money. Yeah. So twenty-five million of that's going to go to student athletes, and you're yeah. going to have you're going to have a twenty-five million dollar. TV budget, you know, that, that's going to go into your general budget if you're athletic departments. Not sustainable. The other thing, too, is outside of the Power Five conferences, nobody can nobody can survive that way if, if you do that. Now, in the transformation committee, one of the things that's out there in discussion is, is how much money do student athletes, does the university, do they give? Do they give them a slice of the pie? That's something that is up for d- discussion in the transformation committee. Right now, you've got cost of attendance that students are getting, and you've got the Alston money, which is $6,000 in the SEC. And I think cost of attendance about, um, I don't know what it is a semester now, but you know, th- those, those guys are getting some money there. And some people think they deserve some more money. It's just, what's that realistic number? Because at some point, if you're going to pay them large sums of money, don't they become employees? Yes. Yes, and then, pretty and much. Then, and then, how do you deal with that as a university? If you're going to put they've all, got all kinds of rights, there. yeah, I, I put them on your staff. And now you they, got they get, they get in, they get in 401ks. <laughs> well, they go, they go get workman's comp, but they get hurt on a Saturday on the football field. I mean, you know, you, you just got a whole mess of Are things. Are they going to get unemployment doing. if they get their if they get uh, if they get their <laughs> yeah. scholarship? Done? Yeah, I mean, you know, that, I mean, there, there are player unions and the pros that that handle kind of the, the, these things and. Um, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens out there. I don't think college football is ending or college athletics is ending, but it is certainly changing dr- dramatically. Um, and, and there's going to be changes over the course of the next three to five years that are going to be pretty significant. By the way, think- Ball for Life 37643, is he from Elizabethan, Wilbur, Biltmore, Tennessee, Hunter, Tennessee, Winter, Tennessee, or Dogtown? What are you All are in you, that same are, area. Code. Are you stalk? Are you stalking? Did you say Dogtown? Yeah, I'm gonna put him in Dogtown. Welcome, well, well, great question from Dogtown there at Vol for Life. Uh, Sam Smith, twenty two thirty three, wants to know how can Tim Banks and his staff get better on third downs this year? Rush the quarterback. Um, has Tony Vitello done the best rebuild job of any coach in Tennessee history? Uh, I mean, I guess so because I mean, baseball was just. I mean, look, it wasn't lifeless. I mean, it was, it was bones. When he took it over. I mean, nobody ever thought about it at all. I mean, it was, I mean, it never, it, it was not on my radar. I, I think, I mean, I think if you're looking for somebody to compare it, something to compare it to, you, you got to look at what Pearl did in basketball for Tennessee. That, I, that, even Buzz wasn't that bad. No, no, I mean, no. 
I mean, the, the thing that Tony Vitello has done is, is what he's created from an atmosphere standpoint at, at a dilapidated facility. Call it a hornet's nest, call it whatever you want to call it over there. The, the fact that he's got every, I mean, obviously they're playing well and they're winning, but, but there's not the amenities over there for all those people. I mean, you, you've turned some basically temporary porches out there into a great outfield uh, venue for people to hang out at. And, and you've made baseball, Tony Vitello has made baseball a cool thing. And from that standpoint, it's arguably the best rebuild job that, that we've seen because Rod Del Monaco had Tennessee going well, but they weren't this in terms of interest. And, and, and he had in 95, he had a bunch of local kids that were fueling the interest. That's not necessarily the case with where Tony Vitello has gotten this program right now. So, I, I mean, I, he, it's one of the best rebuilding jobs I've seen, that's for sure. I think it is the best. I've seen. I mean, I, I would I would say him and, and BP are probably pretty equal in how in the interest generated, but BP had to more, more to work with. I mean, that I mean the facilities are I mean were never a problem. Right. For Tennessee. And, you know, it wasn't I mean, they, Tennessee wasn't great under buzz, but I mean, they went to some NITs and, you know, middle of the pack in the SEC. I mean, not anything like what but the resurrection Vitello has engineered. Rocky Topster, over, under, we get two five-stars in this class, AP, your favorite questions. And is Tony Mitchell actually someone to keep an eye on? Those are um, two of AP's favorite questions in one, in one mailbag Tony, post. Tony Mitchell's one I'm going to have to see to believe. Um, and then – got to believe it to I, see it or see it to believe it? Man, whatever. Um <laughs> I, I just want to go push on two. I think they're going to get two. I, I, I think they're going to get Carnell Tate. And I just want I, – Francis is going to get harder the longer it goes. You know, can they get him in the boat sometime in the next 45 to 60 days? Yep. We'll see. Before what he, fall. You're saying before fall. Yeah. It just feels like the longer it goes, the harder it's going to get. That's not to say they can't land him in the fall, but I just think it's way easier, you know, to get him coming here off Memorial Day weekend and get some momentum and follow that up, you know, with stuff in June, you know, hanging out with Nico and talking to these other guys. I mean, he sees Cornell all the time. Jval 865 I'm hearing a lot of talk about Heupel's second year, and this will prove if he's the right coach or not. I'm not sure where that talk's coming from. That he has to beat Florida and win nine to ten games this year which if he did, that would be our best season since 2007. Considering the program he took over just a year ago, does this type of talk not seem premature? Yes. Yes. I mean, it's that's not to say they can't do it, though. I mean, yeah. you know, you have to run the table in September, and then all of a sudden everything shifts. But, I mean, you're right. I mean, Tennessee has had, what, two win or one winning season or two winning seasons in league play I mean, I'm since 2007. I mean, like, I, you know, they just they, – they've not been good enough and they've not won more than, you know, eight games in a regular season since 2007. I mean, I'm literally hearing no one say he's got to win nine or ten and this is a make-or-break season. Are you Are you guys? I mean, no. I mean, I, I mean, I, and, and not, I mean, I, I'm not hearing anybody saying that this, this year is going to prove if he's the right coach or not. I mean, absolutely not. I mean, I, I think, you know, again, if, if I were putting odds on it right now, I would say this is probably an eight-win, you know, a seven- to eight-win football team. That's where I put it at. Not to say they can't get to nine wins, but that's I mean to do that, AP, you got to run September, right? You, you, you run September and then it all show, it all shifts. Right. It all but, shifts at that point. But that's a big if. And if they don't run September, that doesn't mean they're a failure uh, either. Um, his second question: Do you think we ever see a time where home and home becomes more prominent in college football again? Some of these out of conference matchups are great, but playing in the playing these in these sterile pro stadiums take away much of what's so great about college football, unique traditions, getting to see other campuses, tailgating, et cetera. That's Amen. Awesome. Did you write that question, Austin? That was good. AP, is that your, <laughs> is, is that your burner I didn't realize your – I didn't know you realized your burner account was Jball 865 <laughs> it, it apparently is, I, but I agree with him. I, I hate that crap. I mean, I hate these pro stadiums. Again, I get next year's start, it, you know, finding a happy medium between going to Provo, Utah and – you know, not having to play BYU, whatever. But, I mean, like, going forward, like, it, it needs to be home and homes. Like, you know, unless they're just getting an insanely amount of money. I don't disagree, but, Hubbard, don't you – I don't have a problem with Nashville at all. I mean, just because of the fan base, the alumni, 
numbers down there. I mean, like playing somewhere like Charlotte is, is garbage to me, but I don't have a problem with throwing, you know, putting, putting one in Nashville every few years. Yeah, here's my thing, though, in Nashville, and, and I don't disagree with you. I mean, I can give Nashville a bone there, particularly when, I mean, the Titans are going to get a new stadium at, at some point and all of that. But but if you're going to do that in Nashville, don't play Wyoming and Bowling Green. Like, like if you're going to do one of those, I mean, do it. Make it. Good point. Make it a good enough team in there that it creates some kind of energy in there. I mean, part of the reason why those seem st- stale is because – you're, you're not playing anybody that gets you going. And, and I'll say this. I mean, I, you know, I, I, Austin, I've kidded with you, but, but I do think, I mean, I, I enjoyed going to Oklahoma. It, it was, it was good to see that. I, I enjoyed my trip to South Bend twice. Uh, I would like to see Boston college. Um, I, I, you know, I hope the Washington thing happens because I would like to go see that campus. I You'll be retired by then. You'll be retired by then. Well, how be. about this? How about this is a happy medium? APC, could you get on board with this? Kind of, kind of like how Tennessee did with Gonzaga in basketball a few years ago, where they played in Nashville and Seattle. You know, kind of home games, but not in the home stadium. What if you played? No. Like you just mentioned, Boston College. If you played them in Gillette Stadium, and no. they came down here and played in Nashville. No. I, I could get on board. With if, if I'm playing, like a, if I'm playing a neutral site game, then let's do what Nebraska is doing and go to Ireland. <laughs> Let's we'll sign that up, Danny White. <laughs> get to Ireland. Get to Ireland. And play. Do you think Hover, can you got imagine, any Irish in him? Hover, can you imagine the 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 like wheeling and dealing AP would be doing to get on? Oh, it would be epic. Forces? It would be well, epic. It would be, well, it would be uncontrollable. They're, they're, I would be doing. I would be doing a month long run up over there. <laughs> I mean, tours. I mean, he would have he would have a separate suitcase just for Peter Millar golf gear. And he would buy new golf clubs to go over there and play with. There's no way he would play with his current bag to, to, to go over there and play. And then he would want to go do a scouting deal over there. Hey, hey, Hubbard, I got a good idea. I'm going to go over there and do a video of the stadium. We'll get some great shots and do some promotional stuff over there. I think I need to go over about four months in advance of that trip. Um, oh, he'd find some like little soccer kid that was a kicker. <laughs> <laughs> to go over and do a recruiting interview with. <laughs> to a commitment video from, from the shorts of Ireland on a soccer kicker. All right, volunteer at 87. Do you see Pierce having a, any third down packages this year, or is he just too lean and too fresh to the program to realistically see the field this fall? Also, pancake or waffles? Pan fried or oven for cooking bacon? Blackstone for bacon so it doesn't smell up the house. And... um. I'm rolling. I could roll a Belgian waffle, but, but really probably neither. Pr- probably pancakes over waffles. I'm really neither on belt on pancakes or waffles. I, I'm, I'm looks like a waffle guy. I'm I'm indifferent on that. Now bacon pan fried. Anybody that says oven is uh, stop. It's stop. only for convenience. If I if, if time is an issue, oven for oven. But otherwise, you're right. I'm with you, AP. 100. percent All right, let's you get you cook it slow. And and as my grandmother told me a long time ago. If you think it's almost done, it's done. Take it off. There you go. Uh, Pierce, too lean to be a factor, AP? No. I mean, I'm not saying he's going to be a big factor, but I don't think he's too lean to be a factor, no. All right. Uh, Anthron wants to know, the Polynesian linebacker coming in with Nico for Memorial Day weekend. Anything to see there, or is that just a long shot? Uh, I call it a long shot, but, I mean, again, you know, I'd say seven months ago, Nico was a long shot, so – uh, you never say never. Never say never. Is the Jack Luttrell stuff a result of a kid committing too early and now wanting to be truly recruited, wind and dine, or is there something going on there? I, mean, I think so. I mean, you know, he says some right, some of the right things, but, you know, I mean, he, he flirts around on social media. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, when you commit as early as he did and you like social media, it's natural to kind of enjoy when somebody else, you know, bats their eyes at you so you know I, I mean I think it's more than just Luttrell I think you have to watch Luttrell and Ethan Davis both I mean you know Ole Miss is taking a swing at both of them and we'll see um you know what happens there but you know I mean I think for right now I think Tennessee's gonna be okay but you know long again, long ways till December yeah it's recruiting yeah do you think Justin Brown ends up at the class if he camps well this summer no okay uh, why are the Vols being forced to pay BYU to get out of their game next year when it was BYU who wanted out? 
Tennessee is not paying BYU. The National Sports Council, based off the ticket sales, is, is paying them. Tennessee will still get money off of the ticket sales uh, in Nashville, which will exceed the number of money that the amount of money that BYU has, BYU has to pay out. Here's the thing. BYU, if Tennessee were going to have to write BYU a check out of their budget, Tennessee would be going to Provo, Utah. But there, here's an opportunity to get out of the game. BYU does not really want to play Tennessee and Arkansas over a three a three week stretch and then jump into the to the Big Twelve where they I think open with Baylor. It looks like at this point. So yes, BYU is interested in getting out. Virginia was looking for a game. It's not costing Tennessee anything out of their pocket. They're actually going to save some money because you don't have to fly a, a charter a plane out there. And by the way, Rob. Do you want do you want to go to BYU with two or three new starters on the offensive line, a freshman quarterback most likely, a brand new set of linebackers, maybe two new defensive ends, and two new safeties? I, if I was Josh Chipel, I would have never wanted to go to BYU. I'm Just, not sure he ever did. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> Not, I mean, not, and not because, I mean, I would not because I'm saying Tennessee can't win. That's just, you know, if, if you win, ho hum. If you lose, you know, the sky's falling. Yeah. And I don't think it was a great experience for Central Florida when they went out there and played BYU uh, as well. Um, I bet that factored into it. You know, so, I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line with with that deal. Again, if it were going to cost Tennessee money out of their purses, out of their pocketbook, Tennessee would be going to BYU. But, but that's the biggest difference there um, in, in a nutshell. All right, let's get to a couple more of these here. Uh, Burrow Boys 615, what does the summer look like for the guys on the football team leading up to fall practice? Do they have individual position meetings? Yes, uh, lots of workouts, lots of throwing sessions on their own. They can do some meeting time with coaches or well, as well. Carnell, Date, st- Carnell Tate still looking at an early June commitment date, AP? Mid. Mid-June. And what's the recruiting schedule for the rest of the summer? Is there a dead period after Memorial Day event? When do the Elite uh, 11 opening five-star challenges take place? I don't have all those dates. Most of them are The dead period starts after the the, the the 26th. So the midnight of the 26th of June will be the dead period through the whatever, like third or fourth week in July. Um, then it opens back up for one week before it shuts down again for the month of August. Um you know, and then they'll have a lot of official visitors here. I think there'll be four here next week. Um, uh, Big Burley, Nico, Bryce, and Sanders, and um, Lucas Simmons. That's a pretty then, good foursome right there. Um, and then yes, there'll be a bunch of official visitors, especially that's that the seventeenth and twenty fourth. Hey, what, what uh, the Memorial Day weekend? How many of those? All those kids are officials? Just four. four. Four and the rest. Oh, of those are the. That was the week you're talking about. Yeah. The, those, oh, okay. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. That week, those four that weekend. Everybody else is a, is an unofficial that weekend. Uh, Deshaun thirteen. After this year, Tennessee loses a lot of starters. Does Josh Heupel have to rely on the transfer portal to rebuild this roster? While this class will be strong, you can't just rely on freshmen. Seems like the coaching carousel will catch up with Tennessee next year. Uh, I don't know what the last part of that means, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they're always going to look at the portal, uh, and they do lose a lot off the roster. I, I just think that that's, um, I mean, I think that's part of it. And, um, I think that every coach out there is going to be looking at the transfer portal. What you hope to do is you hope to get to the point, Rob, where you're looking to spot fill two or three spots, as opposed to, Hey, you got a need on the defensive line, linebacker, corner, receiver, tight end, running back you know, offensive line, which is where Tennessee has been. Yeah, and I, and that, I think it's interesting. I know we, we've talked about it a little bit. I th- it's, it's way different in, in football and basketball. I mean, part, part of, you know, part of it is because you play so many different, you know, so many different guys in football. But in basketball, there doesn't seem to be that same reluctance to, you know, go get three guys who are going to be starters in the transfer portal. I mean, Arkansas did it, had great success. Um, Kentucky, I don't know. I mean, a bunch of their dudes were – we're transferring it, but I, I mean, I just, for one, I don't think the numbers there in football, you know, you're not going to again, what would the equivalent of three starters in basketball be like 28 guys, or, yeah, I mean, excuse me, a, like 14 guys. Yeah, but it'd be a whole lot of people. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's I don't, just different. Yeah, I don't think that's feasible, but I, I mean, I think the transfer portal is huge. And I, I think Tennessee, I mean, you know, they're not Alabama or Ohio state, but I mean, for a program, 
that's where Tennessee has been the last five or six years. I think Heifel, those guys have done a great job in the portal. Two, two recruiting questions here, AP. How is Tennessee standing with Cameron Seldon, Zach Myers, and why are they looking potentially at a running back? Like in the portal? Yes. Portal running back. And where do they stand with the other two? Um, portal Sorry. running back because the kid from Sam Houston State's a one for one. So, like, he doesn't hurt your recruiting class. He can take away from your numbers and you've got an open spot. And he would be um, the only running back that would be a possibility. Yeah. All right. Um, Myers and Seldon. Myers down the list. Seldon. Tennessee brings him in for an official visit in June, and they're hoping to really help cement themselves there. Is, is this the one that AB has called the next Debo Samuel cover? Yeah, that's the one I've compared him to, yes. <laughs> He's a pretty good-looking athlete, can do a lot of things. We'll see if they can get him on campus. All right, last question out the door here. i got one more after you go. Go ahead. All right, hurry. We'll run through this one. LF Vol, two questions. On the Tuesday pod, Brent said that any potential TV revenue would be shared across all sports. Isn't the football revenue separate or at minimum specified in the new agreement? If so, wouldn't it be simple to uh, appropriate a small percentage of football only money to football players? Same concept for other sports. Nope. Title IX, football fuels uh, those non-revenue sports. And if you're going to give football players part of the TV money, all student athletes are going to get a cut of TV money. Uh, that's just the way that that's going to work. I read that Napier hired 63 people in his football staff. We all know Alabama and Georgia have big organizations. How does Hypel staff size compare to Florida and others? I don't know the total number they've added to it. I don't think Tennessee is shorthanded. That would be my that would be my specification. Is I don't believe Tennessee is shorthanded on their staff at this point. Would they add some more people? I'm sure they will as they grow particularly if you come back with this unlimited staff size, which is part of what the transformation committee is talking about. But I, I don't think Josh Heupel is shorthanded right now from a staff standpoint. AP, your question is? Um, Darrell Middleton, who's now still looking for a football home, back on the market. Thoughts? Not at Tennessee. It's not going to happen. Co co com committed to Derek Dooley as a freshman. Golly. <laughs> That's my favorite part of the whole story. About, hey, let's Hubbard, let's give our guy a shout out. Bra it may not have been his first official, vi unofficial visit, but the first time I saw Daryl Middleton on campus, he was escorted by Gibbs, current Gibbs High School assistant, Dustin Minot. <laughs> I hope you're listening, Mr. Minot. <laughs> wow. That tells, that tells you it's been a, that, that Darrell Middleton has been around for a while. I mean, he surpasses anything Gerald Williams, right? In terms of the Gerald Williams trying to get to Tennessee, I mean, Darrell oh Middleton, no, that's a that's an absolute he's, he's, classic. I mean, but 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 I mean, it feels like it feels like Darrell Middleton's a ten year recruit. Is he a ten year yeah, recruit? That's, well, that's yeah, true. I mean, I mean, Dooley's been gone. Butch coached for five years. Now, granted, that was his freshman year of high school when he committed to Dooley. Right. You know, I know we got two minutes left. <laughs> I mean, like Dooley, Dooley's been gone. We had five years of Butch, three years of Pruitt. And one year, Dooley's been fired from three jobs since then. <laughs> this is true; he has indeed. But <laughs> I, I mean, on a serious note, though, I, I mean, if Tennessee has room, I hear that um, Daryl, Darrell Middleton, and Etrick Lofton are both in play <laughs> for, for roster spots. <laughs> both are making their way back. No, neither are going to be here. All right, out the door. Tiger Woods making the cut, not making the cut. AP, he's making the cut, and I think it'll be if he does, it'll be the a way bigger a, a, achievement than Augusta. Maybe right. asking for a friend. What do you think about Tiger in the top he's 20? Got a, he's got a putt better. There you go. Uh, yeah, that's where we draw the line. I just don't know stamina. I think right. he will hit it fine, though. Get the stinger right. back in play this week and a new three iron that lets him hit it higher. Uh, there you go. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the VolQuest.com Mailbag Podcast presented by Smoky Mountain Organics. For Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Thursday, everybody. Mailbag Podcast every week right here on VaultQuest.